Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurosurgery. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope that we find you all safe and well. If this is your first time joining us for Fridays of Freelander, we've covered many remarkable topics by incredible expert UPMC and University of Pittsburgh neurosurgeons, researchers, and trainees. If you've missed any of our past presentations or would like to view them, please visit our dedicated Fridays with Freelander page on our department website at www.neurosurgery.pit.edu. All of our attendees' mics are muted, but you can type a question in the Q&A chat box and we'll try to get to as many as we can in our allotted time. This week, we're delighted to highlight one of our extraordinary and leg legendary expert neurosurgeons, Dr. Joseph Maroon. But first, I would like to welcome our Chair of Neurosurgery, Dr. Robert Freelander, to give an update on the happenings from the last week. Dr. Freelander, thank you and please take it away. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Justin. You're all in for a treat uh, today. Uh, what I'd like to do is what I usually do is uh, to provide a uh, summary on the situation with uh, COVID uh, around our region and our hospitals, and then uh, introduce our uh, speaker today. So first of all, uh, situation with uh, COVID uh, has uh, improved over the past uh, week and obviously has uh, improved uh, radically over the past uh, month or so. Our hospitals were you know, almost uh, 25, 30% of our beds were actually occupied by COVID uh, patients uh, back in uh, December and that, that constituted about 1,200 uh, patients. Uh, currently, uh, the numbers have uh, reduced uh, uh, continuously and we're uh, significantly below 200. So again, that's a really a positive thing. I mention all this uh, because my uh, greatest fear is people not to come to the hospital because they worry about uh, COVID. Uh, our hospitals are very, very safe. We take extreme precautions to optimize the safety of everybody. Most of the, if not all the healthcare workers and everybody working in the hospital has been vaccinated. Again, that's uh, very important, uh, not only for the individual, but also the likelihood of transmitting COVID uh, of, uh, from somebody who's been vaccinated is uh, is uh, fairly minimal to, to none. So again, our hospitals are very safe. Extreme measures are, are taken for cleanliness, as well as everybody's temperatures are taken uh, before they come into the hospital. So again, I urge anybody who needs to see a doctor, please uh, reach out uh, to your healthcare uh, providers. We're doing a lot of uh, telemedicine, so many of our patients actually don't even need to come uh, to the hospital. We can uh, uh, evaluate them uh, via uh, telemedicine. <clears throat> Now, uh, I'm uh, truly uh, uh, delighted and honored uh, to introduce uh, my uh, great friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Joseph uh, Maroon. Dr. Maroon is a legend in many fields, not only in neurosurgery, but uh, really throughout uh, many different things that he's uh, done. His life uh, uh, really is amazing in all the different uh, things uh, that he participates uh, in. He's a very, very kind individual. He believes in uh, wellness uh, as an example uh, profoundly and to put his uh, money where his uh, mouth and heart uh, are. Uh, he donated a gym for our residents. Our residents, as you know, work extremely hard and have very limited time to go exercise. And uh, he furnished uh, a, a gym which uh, bears uh, his name uh, right now. So obviously we're very fortunate that to have him as uh, part of our uh, team in our uh, department. Dr. Maroon is also the neurosurgeon for the Steelers, a legendary uh, neurosurgeon. And really uh, every time he gives a, a talk, I'm always a fascinated. He puts in a lot of time uh, and effort. And today's talk uh, will be uh, uh, one like that as well. I heard uh, a prior version of it uh, when he delivered it uh, to our department uh, uh, recently. So Dr. Maroon, thank you very much uh, for joining us and uh, please take it away. Thank you very much, Robert. It's a great pleasure to share uh, quite a few experiences with you today. Last week, I was a judge in a shark-like invited competition by Rob and Cindy Citrone, uh, part owners of the Steelers, in which they submitted they asked students to submit proposals on how to approach the epidemic and mental health that we're now experiencing, particularly in students with depression, anxiety, and various fears, and how the students would, would approach this to, to assist their colleagues. And I became very aware that not only are we confronting an epidemic of the COVID virus, but we're also now in the midst of a huge epidemic, a pandemic of mental health. And mental health episodes. You know, as a neurosurgeon, a brain surgeon, if you would, I, I've spent 
over four decades of my life diagnosing and treating patients with structural problems of the brain. Traumatic brain injuries, brain tumors, aneurysms, arteriovenous malformations. And I've, I've been very impressed having all that decades of experience with the structural problems. And when I was listening to these students, I became acutely aware of the functional abnormalities of the brain, like pathological depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, schizophrenia, and, and the worst type of violent behavior. Well, it reminded me, I had a deja vu experience of when I was in medical school at Indiana University. And in my second year, I, I actually worked my way through medical school for room and board, living and working at the Central State Mental Institution for the Insane. And my job, along with 10 other medical students, was to do histories and physicals annually on close to 2,000 patients who were refractory to all medications and, uh, and basically warehoused, if you would. Today, I'm going to do something that I've not done before. I'm going to discuss and illustrate for you the structure of the brain, but I'm also going to emphasize the functional abnormalities that have plagued man since we swung down from the trees onto the savanna in Africa 2.4 million years ago. And, and what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to show you a brain. This is a human brain that is exemplary of a young 35 year old man with three kids who was extremely depressed, failed all psychotropic drugs, electric shock therapy, and eventually ended his life. Uh, and when we look at the brain like this, structurally, it looks quite the same as any other brain. And the same gyri, the same foci, the same, the, the same cortex. But what we, what we know is that structurally, we all look like the same. But functionally, things happen in our brain that uh, lead to all sorts of very difficult abnormalities in, in the pandemic with isolation, despair, severe depression, uncontrollable fears and anxiety, drug overdoses. All of this stuff is kind of an introduction to what I want to discuss with you today. And I'm going to do three things. Number one, I'm going to give you an overview of the treatment of mental and behavioral disorders basically from Neolithic times, 5,000 years ago to the present and beyond. And I'm going to do that, as I said in the title, through the eyes of myself as a, as a neurosurgeon. And then I'm going to uh, explain to you the wiring diagram of the brain and the incredible advances in, 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 in evaluating what's called the connectome, which I will describe in some detail to you. And then I'm going to describe for you the treatment of severe mental, mental disorders from the past up to the present, including neuromodulation and new techniques, including psychedelic drugs that are now actually wanting to be legalized by the California legislature uh, and, and beyond. So let's get started with this right now. Uh, we mentioned that depression, anxiety is up threefold throughout the country and the suicide rate, suicidal ideation uh, is a pandemic just like the virus. And I mentioned the treatment. I'm going to discuss the connectome and then the current non-invasive forms of psychosurgery or neuromodulation. This is the hospital, literally, it is the hospital, the Central State Hospital for the Insane that I, I lived and worked for two years uh, and uh, was exposed to patients that were so debilitated and, and it made such an impression on me. And it was patterned after this hospital in London, uh, the Bethlehem Hospital that was subsequently called the Bedlam Hospital. So the word Bedlam describes and it, it, it comes from the chaotic aspect of the patients who were imprisoned literally in these because there was no other treatment for mental disease. The catatonic patients that I literally saw 
on the floors of Central State Hospital like this when I made rounds. The chairs hanging from the ceiling in which they would suspend patients and spin them rapidly for 30 to 60 minutes at a time. The, 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 the cells, the chains, and the straight jackets and the cages and the padded cells, all of the things that were only, that, that was only what was available to treat patients at that time. So going back to the history, the real history of brain disorders, initially it was thought to be due to demons, bad spirits, uh, uh, possession by the devil, and even the Incas 3000 years ago were using these devices that you see on the left to scrape a hole and let the evil spirits come out of their brain. And then in the Middle Ages, it was called searching for the stone. It was thought by the religious that there was a stone, a loose stone in the brain that resulted in migraines, in headaches, in epilepsy, in obsessive compulsive, in paranoia, in violent behavior. So priests and nuns and the, 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 the doctor shaman would again allow these spirits to emit from the brain. Skipping from that to 1848, this is Phineas Gage. A, a, uh, he was a railroader at age 28 in Vermont when he was tamponing dynamite uh, into exploding the rock to, for the railway, a spark ignited and this particular rod which is three feet long and an inch in diameter, was propelled through his infraorbital area, through the skull, and exited out the left side, the uh, right side of his brain. And this is a model in the Harvard Museum that uh, is, is still there. Well, his case was reported by Dr. Harlan. He lived and survived for quite a few years after that. But this previous respectful, religious, spiritual kind individual subsequently to this injury became uh, in disinhibited, uh, irreverent, uh, used swearing, which he never did before, and, and was really a different personality. The significance of this, ladies and gentlemen, it, it was the first real observation that damage to the frontal lobes of the brain could lead to emotional disorders and might be related uh, to some of the problems that were confronted. So we're skipping forward to 1933 with John Fulton, a brilliant neuroscientist at Yale, trained under Harvey Cushing, actually at Harvard. And uh, he was very interested in the cortical function of the brain. And he was the first to initiate a primate lab in which he operated on monkeys and removed different parts of the brain to try to correlate what functionally in the body that related to. And he, he, on one occasion, took two monkeys, Becky and Lucy, and removed their frontal lobes. And subsequently, uh, he presented these two monkeys at a conference in 1935 in, uh, in England, in London. And he noted that these two, these two monkeys subsequently, after the frontal lobotomy, were very docile, uh, indifferent to uh, exposure, uh, had devoid of emotional expression, and entirely free of anxiety and frustrational behavior. In the audience was Agos Moniz, a Lisbon, neuros a Lisbon neurologist who was in charge of several hundred warehouse patients in a mental institution in Lisbon, Portugal. And he literally asked the question, might this procedure be effective in humans who are now incarcerated, warehoused, no treatment available. So he collaborated with Al Pedro Almeida Lima, a neurosurgeon who uh, was trained in, in, in London by one of the individuals who actually I trained under, Joe Pennybacker at Oxford. And they decided to make a trephine hole in one of the patients, a middle-aged woman, Sarah, severely paranoid and depressed, and inject alcohol uh, into the middle of her brain on both sides. And uh, they reported that this really did alleviate, 
she became, if you would, like the chimpanzees, docile and uh, indifferent to stimulation and calm. She need, no longer needed to be in a padded cell or a straitjacket or, or chained to the wall. Subsequently, uh, he and others went on to treat manic depression, schizophrenia, uh, Alzheimer's disease, postpartum depression and PTSD with this frontal lobotomy approach. And he published his papers uh, in French literature and reported 35% were cured, 30% improved, and only, only a one-third failure rate. But you have to put this in the context of the time. At that time, in the United States, there were over 500,000 patients warehoused in mental institutions with no effective treatment, costing over $1.5 billion a year, so that there was a huge frustration about the treatment of mental disease. Walter Freeman is a, neuro a neurologist uh, who was also at that meeting, followed Moniz's work, and subsequently Im improved, in quotes, on the procedure. And he came to the United States and he devised a new approach to doing a frontal lobotomy in which he would insert a steel rod, essentially an ice pick, above the eyebrow into the brain for a depth of six centimeters and then twist it one way and then the other to separate the frontal cortex from the deeper thalamic and emotional structures of the brain. Now, I'm going to show you a movie next. And for those who, who are a, a bit apprehensive about watching it, uh, watching movies of surgery, I, I suggest you, you turn your head for this uh, because it, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to watch. But this is Walter Freeman performing a frontal lobotomy uh, on a patient using electric shock therapy for anesthesia. Frontal lobotomy is performed during the stage of post-convulsive coma. The electrodes are applied and the first shock is given. The convulsion lasts about 40 seconds. When the patient shows signs of returning consciousness, a second convulsion is administered. Usually three successive convulsions are necessary, but in old people a single one may be sufficient, while in a sturdy young person four or even six convulsions may be administered without danger. Now that the convulsion has subsided, the nurse holds a towel over the nose and mouth of the patient. The operator lifts the upper eyelid, inserts the locator into the conjunctival sac and aims it parallel with the bony ridge of the nose. He drives the point through the orbital plate and at a depth of five centimeters swings the handle far laterally. He then returns the instrument to a slightly oblique position, still parallel with the bony ridge of the nose and drives it two centimeters further. Steadying the patient's head, he then moved the handle of the instrument about 20 degrees medially and 30 degrees laterally. In this latter position, he strongly elevates the handle of the instrument, often fracturing the orbital plate. And then finally returns the instrument to the parasitical plane. I, I, this even shakes me watching that, but it's so important because it led to several other things and I'm putting it in historical context for you. So he was so aggressive in this, he had what was called the lobotomobile in which he would go around to mental institutions and prisons uh, doing his procedure as an outpatient, non-sterily uh, taking 20 minutes to disconnect somebody's frontal lobes. One of his most significant failures was Rose Kennedy, the sister of JFK, the daughter of Joseph Kennedy, uh, who had an ADHD and a little, and possibly a seizure disorder, a little behavioral abnormality uh, that today would be treated possibly with Adderall and other drugs. Uh, this was done uh, at age 23 and for the next 63 years, 
she was incontinent, debilitated, and lived in a total care facility. Uh, obviously, uh, the complications started to uh, become noted. Between 1945 and 1955, over 50,000 patients were lobotomized. A horrible experience. However, uh, again, going on with our with our narrative, uh, James Papes was a, 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 a physician and neurologist at Cornell University who described in 1949 the emotional circuits of the brain, how the brain uh, in, in terms of fight, flight, fear, sex, hunger, diet, how our emotional systems are operant and where they're located in the brain. And that led to others using a stereotactic head device, which was invented in 1949 by Weissis and Spiegel in, in, in Philadelphia, in which a needle or probe can be inserted very accurately almost any place in the brain. And Irvin Cooper was a pioneer neurosurgeon at St. Barnabas Hospital in New York, who used this for the treatment of Parkinson's disease and essential tremor. Subsequently, investigators used it for doing these operations in the emotional circuits of the brain, rather than a frontal lobotomy, they interfered or ab ablated the emotional circuits in a much more controlled fashion in different layers of the brain for obsessive compulsive disease and mental illness of different kinds. Uh, this is a picture of myself, again, uh, in Indiana University as a resident, when they would bring patients from the prisons in California to have bilateral amygdalotomies. The amygdala is the emotional repository of the brain, where Dr. Heimberger, who was my chief, did bilateral amygdalotomies in these patients to reduce their violent behavior. I had to do histories and physicals on these people in chains, and uh, they obviously were not uh, anxious to have their brains operated upon the next day. Moving along, deep brain stimulation was the next very big uh, uh, accomplishment by Benabit in 1987. While stimulating a patient with Parkinson's disease, uh, prior to making a destructive lesion, he noticed with stimulation, electrical stimulation, the tremor dis was disappeared without making a lesion. That has led to deep brain stimulation existing today for Parkinson's, essential tremor, and other diseases where we implant electrodes into different circuits of the brain, a subcutaneous stimulator, and using electricity uh, generated with this stimulator, able to control things, Parkinson's, tremor, sometimes depression, looking at it for obesity and OCD. That moves us along to really that those exam, those observations previously led to the Connectome Project, which in 19, in 2010, the NIH gave $40 million to several universities to study the wiring diagram of the brain. This is very important because really very few physicians actually are, are aware of how the brain's wiring makes us who we are. And they, the goal was to get a comprehensive global description of the structural and the functional connectivity within the human brain. And using very sophisticated MRI and, and other imaging and mathematical formulations called the graph theory, they were, were able to, die, to discern networks networks with nodes, edges, and how the complexity of the brain is wired, as we see here, with, the, with millions of connections between neurons and, 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 and axons. And actually, there are several very definitive neural networks, one called the default mode, the salience, what's important and what's not, and, and also our executive cortex, or cognitive uh, functional network. Now, if you rec you don't recall, I'm going to share with you, inside our brain, the brain I showed you, 
there's 85 to 100 billion neurons or microtransistors with up to 100 trillion connections and over 200,000 different fiber tracks like I showed you on that diagram. There's now a new science of connectomics. It's a new paradigm for understanding brain disease and also brain health. We're recognizing that in psychiatric disorders, no family is untouched by this or a friend or relative, that psychiatric disorders, there's a miscommunication between the networks of the connectome. So this paper emphasizes that psychiatric diagnoses based on symptoms may be scientifically meaningless. That's a pretty profound, heavy statement. So the way diagnoses are categorized now, psychiatrists and others use what's called the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. In this are 297 mental, dis mental disorders that are described that the physician, psychologist, psychologist, hears the history and then says, well, your symptoms seem to fit into one of these 297 categories. So this does not, however, reflect the underlying function or structure of the brain. And as stated here, all those, these diagnostic labels create the illusion of an explanation of what's going on. They are scientifically meaningless and create stigma and prejudice. And they contribute, medical sound labels contribute, they don't contribute to anything to our understanding of the complex causes of human distress. Ladies and gentlemen, this is extremely a profound observation. And I'm going to switch to another subject at this point, keeping the connectome in mind. I'm going to add to it now with a quote from Heraclitus, who 2,500 years ago, now think about this when I say it, why can't you ever step into the same river twice? And the reason for that, it's constantly changing. And as Heraclitus said, there's nothing permanent except change. But what he predicted and was really beautifully described 2,500 years ago was the concept of neuroplasticity. Our brains are constantly changing, just like the river. Your sight, taste, hearing, touch, all of these are constantly sending impulses into your brain with your medical activity and your thought. They create new neurostructures and connections with those billions of neurons and fiber tracks. The more you repeat repetitive activity, it strengthens the neural connections, and then we develop wired connections. Now, in addition to our thoughts, our words, and our, and our sensory input, other factors affect the wiring diagram, our diet, our physical activity. Stress is a horrible contributor to PTSD and another wiring abnormality. Environmental factors, how we're raised, whether we're how, how we're coddled and treated and the enrichment of our environmental factors, sleep, adversity, toxins, all of these are above the genome. They're epigenetic, which help, which contribute to the wiring of the brain. The woman who smokes crack while she's pregnant will modulate the, the, the neurons of her baby's brain to subsequently have a propensity towards addiction. So, Having said all that as background, we're now going to talk about uh, what's new and what's un, un, virtually unknown in the people that I talk to in medicine and layman of what can be done to modulate behavior. And let's look at the episode, let's look at depression as one example. Over 13, 13 to 15 million people in the United States have major depression disorder, major. Half of these are not treated, and another 500 to 700 are poorly served. They're poorly served because current available medications are inadequate or have deleterious side effects. Fewer than 50% of these will achieve full remission, and treatment resistance is very common. So we need something better. And what I'm going to share with you in the next few minutes are the non-surgical treatments 
that have evolved for mental illness uh, over drugs and over barbaric things like frontal lobotomies. And we're going to discuss neuromodulation. In everything, as Aristotle said, the goal is to seek the mean between all extremes. Neuromodulation seems it has the, the, the purpose to seek balance between the brain's operating networks that we described. This is a, a, an article from the New York Times last week, featured in the New York Times Magazine, Can Zapping Our Brains Really Cure Depression? By Stimulating Neurons, Can You Address Psychological Behavior? Well, we can. And that whole concept is considered neuromodulation. The, the, the activating different neural circuits using magnetic energy, direct electrical energy, even audiovisual energy, and photo, light photobiomodulation and ultrasonic biomodulation. So let's look at transcranial magnetic stimulation and, and what it is. This is a non-invasive method for altering nerve activity using a focused magnetic field here that's placed over the patient's cranium at different areas. It can be used to potentiate or suppress neuro, neuronal activities. In other words, it can inhibit abnormal formed neural circuits or it can activate circuits that may need to be beneficially activated. It's FDA approved, it stimulates neurons directly, and it also functions to enhance BDNF. BDNF is a molecule in the brain that does three things. It contributes to the production of new brain cells, new neurons. It enhances the synaptic connections between neurons, and it facilitates neuroplasticity that we just discussed. And Nolan Williams at Stanford is, you, is actually doing this five times a day for one week. The usual treatment sessions is daily for five times, uh, five days a week for four to six weeks. He has compressed this into a five times per day for one week with a 76% reduction uh, in major depression and uh, full remission in four out of the five that he reported on. What are the conditions being used to treat with TMS? It's an incredible list. Depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, post-concussion syndrome, tinnitus, chronic pain, even uh, 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 age-related memory loss, which, which I'm very intrigued with, uh, given my age-related problems. So that's TMS. The human brain emits electrical activities itself, and these waves can be classified as gamma, beta, alpha, theta, and delta, recorded on an electroencephalogram, and then subsequently using AI and electromagnetic tomography, very sophisticated algorithms, actually determine in North, a normal electrical activity, ADH, depression, anxiety, and even migraine. So we know that brain stimulation really may have a place in countering age-related memory loss. And in the future, these techniques are going to be included with artificial intelligence combined with quantitative EEG that I just showed you and fMRIs to automatically and very sophisticatedly target the specific areas of the brain and the networks that are out of balance. So that's TMS. Another is direct current stimulation, which is a using an anode and a cathode, placing it over the brain, and then sending a very mild electrical signal charge through the brain to again reorientate, reorient uh, neurons and, 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 and uh, networks. This is outpatient. Uh, it's self-administered, contrasted to TMS. It's inexpensive, relatively so. And uh, uh, there are many, many papers on what it does to the brain as a tool to enhance attention uh, for uh, auditory problems and, and, and many, many actually activities. 
that's so we've talked about trans, trans TMS, direct current simulation, and now photobiomodulation is using near infrared light to again reorient the different sources of electricity in the brain. So the future of personalized brain stimulation, a recent article in the Journal of Psychiatry, it can be personalized, it will be, using different forms of therapy, including light therapy. So with a light electrode, it literally can, uh, can stimulate through the orbital cortex here into the frontal lobes of my medial central cortex uh, and, and, and also be supplemented by external electrodes to effect mitochondrial enhancement. The mitochondria are those uh, energy sources that, that make ATP in every cell of our body and uh, are, uh, are reduced with, with oxidative stress, with stress, with uh, emotional disorders. These are the companies that are now really very much active in producing photobiomodulatory devices. And these are the universities that are evaluating this for traumatic brain injury, patients who have suffered traumatic brain injury. And this is recently a seminar I attended by Emiliano Santarnici, a neuroscientist at, at Harvard, using brainwave therapy. I mentioned the brain waves, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, theta, by stimulating these specific brain waves, gamma inducing brain stimulation with external stimulation. He has been able to make changes in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And he speculates, and the investigators at MIT speculate, that they activate microglia. Microglia are the white blood cells in the brain, like the white blood cells when you get a splinter under your fingernail that rushes to remove the detritus and the inflammation. And in this case, they've demonstrated in mice that it literally clears the beta amyloid and tau deposition, uh, which are the hallmarks of Alzheimer's in humans as well. And just last week, February 26th, uh, my friend Ali Razai at WVU reported on his treatment using uh, ultrasound to stimulate the hippocampus, the memory centers of the brain in patients with Alzheimer's disease and, and demonstrated and suggested that this may be a potential breakthrough for Alzheimer's disease. Much, much more research is needed. But these are the kinds of non-invasive energy sources. Electric shock therapy, over 100,000 people a year still receive electric shock therapy for intractable depression when everything else fails. And this is the center at Penn University. They've actually one of the first in the region to establish a non-invasive brain stimulation center to study these non-invasive techniques for brain uh, uh, rewiring. And more recently, psychedelic psychiatry uh, from Timothy Leary in, at Harvard in the 60s and 70s when it was banned. Now they're finding that LSD, MDMA, psilocybin, and others actually may have a therapeutic purpose in very small micro doses under a physician's for again, rewiring, stimulating uh, BDNF and other ways of modulating uh, human behavior. And these are the universities that are actually have programs in psychedelic medicine now. So ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, we've come, uh, uh, we've come uh, uh, an immense way from this treatment of, of mental disorders uh, to neurofeedback, photobiomodulation, deep brain stimulation, and direct electrical cortical stimulation to what we are now on the cusp of is psychedelic assisted psychotherapy to diagnosing with computer algorithms and AI, diagnosing without a history and physical, without a DSM-5, we will eventually be using imaging and AI to make diagnosis like this group in Japan did who were able with 85% accuracy 
to diagnose schizophrenia, autism, and other psychoses without a history and physical. So we can't leave without talking about briefly uh, Elon Musk, who said who who spent over three hundred million dollars hiring psych hiring hi, hiring bioengineers to develop technology for a computer, a brain computer interface for inserting electrodes in the human brain for modulating directly behavior. And we've done significant advances here in the Department of Neurosurgery uh, in the past with brain computer interface with engineers from Carnegie Mellon University. And it's only a time, I think, before we'll probably be able to download information from the brain onto the computer and maybe even know what people are thinking. Very futuristic, but from, from where we've been and where we are now, who knows where it's going. So with that, I'll conclude and uh, be very happy to answer any questions for you. Thank you so much, Dr. Maroon. Uh, what an intri very interesting, intriguing uh, presentation. Just really awesome. Uh, Dr. Freelander, would you like to start us off before we uh, start the Q&A? Sure. Well, Dr. Maroon, very provocative uh, uh, talk. It's the second time I, I hear it, and uh, that video is really moving, the, the first one uh, with the uh, frontal uh, lobotomy for sure. Um, of all the research that's been done with the different uh, stimulation um, paradigms that, that you described, uh, you know, people always worry about uh, you know placebo effects and different uh, aspects of uh, of the work. Which is the one that, in your mind, has the strongest science for the best application at this point? Yeah, I, I think at this time the most data is with transcranial magnetic stimulation, and and as I said, people at Harvard, people at Stanford. I mean, these are really brilliant neuroscientists who are using this as a functional tool, but they're. They're extending it to make it more precise using fMRI, using PET scans, using quantitative EEG to better discern how to locate which specific circuits that need to be inhibited or, or, or stimulated to affect the kinds of uh, emotional modulation that we're desiring. So, and but this is right now, there are five centers uh, here in Pittsburgh, the uh, University of Pittsburgh Western Psychiatric Hospital has two units for transcranial magnetic stimulation, and I'm told they're overbooked uh, because of the failure of psychotropic drugs. Take depression alone. It's such one out of every four or five women over 45 years of age are, ant are, are an, on an anxiolytic or an antidepressive medication. You know, that's a, a huge number. Uh, and, and what's the first thing if a child goes into a for therapy, Adderall is like many, many times used in the United States compared to the rest of the world. So we we really need to expand our our experience, our observations and our clinical investigation of all of these techniques. Thank you, Dr. Maroon. Uh, obviously, a number of questions about the first video that you uh, that you presented. Uh, what year did the video take place? Uh, that was probably early 1940s. OK, uh, did any physicians, nurses or orderlies witness these tactics and think this isn't right or there has has to be a better way? And were they able to voice their opinion, suggested treatment options? Well, Justin, again, I, uh, I want to reemphasize the point that at that time there was no Thorazine, Chlorpromazine, antipsychotics. At that time, if you failed lithium, which is one of the drugs available, uh, and you were uncontrollable or had violent behavior uh, or intractable depression, you were warehoused in an insane asylum. And if you were overactive, you were chained and, and straitjacket and, and all that. So <clears throat> patients after this, were indeed calmed. They were uh, not violent. They were like in the movie, one flew over the cuckoo's nest, if some of those you, you remain that, when Jack Nicholson was lobotomized uh, because he was overactive in the psychiatric institute. And, 
And so it was something was welcome. Agos Moniz got a Nobel Prize in 1949 for making a major contribution to the treatment of psychiatric disease. So that's the context of which all this happened. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Maroon. Um, are there, is there any current research regarding these techniques for stroke-related mental impairment? Yes. That's, again, an excellent question. And uh, we, we have here at the University of Pittsburgh, Dr. Dr. Friedlander recruited a, a brilliant investigator, Marco Capagrosso from Italy, who is absolutely committed to using electrical stimulation post-stroke to help rehabilitate patients, as well as in those patients with intractable pain in which specific areas of the brain and spinal cord can be electrically stimulated to modulate or control the pain fibers in the brain and the spinal cord. This is a huge area of investigation using electrical, magnetic, ultrasonic stimulation for rehabilitation purposes. So thank you, Dr. Maroon. Uh, question here, sort of near and dear to both our hearts here. Will the recently announced generous gift from the Tall family help to support AR research? Yes, and, and I appreciate you mentioning that as well. Uh, the Tall Family Foundation here in Pittsburgh has recently given a very generous grant to support our endeavors into the utilization, again, of another neuroimaging platform called augmented reality. Many of you are familiar with virtual reality in which you put on goggles and you can walk through a park or jump out of skydiving or whatever. Augmented reality, what we will what we are able to do now at the University of Pittsburgh is to download images of CAT scans, MRIs, uh, and, and uh, plain x-rays onto a flip down HoloLens, Microsoft HoloLens goggle, in which we're like, like jet pilots fly airplanes. And then with those images, using barcodes on a patient, marry the patient to the images so that we now in real time can look at the patient's brain literally like using X-ray vision, scrolling through the MRI to see any structure in the brain we want. And we can then use a needle or probe to biopsy, uh, uh, stimulate uh, in the brain or in the, in the vertebrae for putting in screws, for instance, for spinal fusions. This is going to revolutionize, in my opinion, how we are using imaging to facilitate the surgical procedures that we do today. And the University of Pittsburgh, the Department of Neurosurgery is really pioneering this in, in this field of neuroimaging. Thank you, Dr. Maroon. Yeah, it's uh, really, uh, we'll have many more interesting talks like this in the future. Uh, I'm sure around that as well. Um, how do we remove the stigma of treating mental illness with psychedelic drugs? Excellent question. I, again, we're, if you, if you draw the, the curve, we're down here uh, of where we're re-looking at, at these agents. And the, the whole thing is, yes, it, it can definitely help. And things like ketamine. Ketamine is a drug that's been used for years in anesthesia and in appropriately administered doses, we now know, can have dramatic effect in patients who have failed everything in chronic depression. And there are clinics now that are opening up around the country, ketamine clinics, just for this reason. But the stigma and the fear is, well, uh, if I take uh, ecstasy, what's it going to do to my brain in a pathological fashion? What are the downside effects? What are the potential risks and complications? So these parameters uh, need to be clearly worked out better in a scientific investigative mode before people go back to uh, psilocybin and ma magic mushrooms and, and ecstasy. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Maroon. Um, how can AR make surgery safer? Well, uh, to, to, to give an example, presently 
many patients with traumatic brain injuries, it's necessary to put a catheter or a little tube into the ventricles, which are the cavities of the brain, to relieve pressure. Uh, the present, presently, the way this is done uh, is, a, is a relatively unsophisticated way by measuring landmarks on the outside of the head and then uh, do, using external landmarks as a uh, trajectory. Well, and, and sometimes it's possible to miss uh, or put the catheter in the wrong place. With this kind of neuroimaging, we're going to be able to literally guide a catheter directly to the spot we want. And we've already shown with two millimeter or so accuracy. So I, right there, it's going to eliminate, I think, uh, or make safer procedures that we are doing now. Thank you. Uh, do you see the fields of psychiatry and neurosurgery working closer together in the future? I think that clearly is something that uh, it's really the whole field of neuroscience. It's not just neurosurgery and psychiatry. It's taking what we're learning here. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim is an investigator here doing studies with psychiatry using a seven Tesla MRI magnet and looking at the fiber tracks and looking at the structure of the brain and co co coordinating it with the functional aspects that the psychiatrists can identify to elucidate that conundrum between structure and function and the patient. So it's the whole field of neuroscience, which is just exploding and taking those observations and that knowledge and applying it to the human brain jointly, psychiatry, neurosurgery, neurology, psychology, all of these disciplines. We need a neuroscience institute uh, that brings all of these together. Uh, and we're working on that here at the University of Pittsburgh. Thank you, Dr. Maroon. OK, here's a question about Alzheimer's disease. Could AR be used as a diagnos diagnostic tool for Alzheimer's disease? Some Alzheimer's earliest symptoms show up as navigational driving difficulties. W it would be unsafe to ask a patient to drive in real life, but AR could provide a more realistic diagnosis than the traditional pen and paper test. What are your thoughts? I, I don't think augmented reality in terms of visual visualizing the landmarks of the brain would contribute to that in a significant way. What does contribute to that in a significant way, of course, are PET scans in which a radioisotope tracer is injected and we can see, I mentioned earlier, the beta amyloid plaque and the neurofibrillary tangles that in mice now using uh, magnetic stimulation of the gamma, right, gamma uh, fibers uh, get lessened. Well, we know that the hippocampus is the first area of the brain in the temporal lobes to atrophy. So uh, and also these markers, biomarkers, are, uh, are now available to give us a diagnosis of, of Alzheimer's disease. But AR, I don't see a future there with that. Thank you, Dr. Maroon. Uh, has psychedelic drug treatments for mental illness been researched in a double blind study? That's, I, I think that is underway now. I'm not aware right now uh, of any, I'm reading several books on psychedelic or psychotherapy with psychedelics. Uh, and uh, I, I'm confident, I'm sure there are studies undergoing with that if they haven't already been done. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Maroon. Uh, why do you think Pitt and UPMC are positioned to be the best leaders in the AR field? Well, I think because we're going to be one of the first in the country to have the equipment uh, from a company called Novarad in Provo, Utah, that came up with uh, really very sophisticated algorithms and, uh, and bioengineering to provide us with the kinds of techniques and, and equipment that's really not available uh, in like it is with us. And with uh, the Toll Foundation, subsidizing and helping us with this, we have we have the School of Engineering, 
We have three residents. We have several faculty. We have a whole team that has already been put together to to really delve into this. Uh, we should have the equipment in the next month or two uh, to really make immense fast strides and then rolling this out to the rest of the country and other neuroscientists for their consideration and use. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Maroon. You mentioned about CT head to recognize schizophrenia. Is there any specific finding on that scan? Well, uh, basically what they did, they measured the court. This is the, the Japanese investigation in which they again use artificial intelligence and various algorithms to measure the thickness of the cortex in the patients that they evaluated. And they found a very distinct correlation between the thickness of the cortex and the abnormal behavior and also the structure in other areas of the brain. So again, using artificial intelligence, which uh, a, a new, a incredible new player in this whole area of, of neuroscience, uh, it's just exploding. And again, Pitt, Carnegie Mellon University, and UPMC are so, so poised with the engineers, the clinicians and the technology really to put this together and, uh, and, and make some major contributions in patient care. The whole bottom line of all this is how, <laughs> is going back to the Neolithic period, I mean, we have the same, we have the same psychopathology that was there on the African savanna in the patient and in, in the individuals who were constantly fearful of their lives. Are they going to be eaten or eat? Uh, and these same basic evolutionary biological straight tra traits and that's wired into our own brains, despite the time, these come out in our own stresses with COVID, the same fight or flight, the same stress, the same cortisol levels, the same coronary disease as, as a million years ago. They come out now in the same depression, in the manic depression, in the paranoia, in the phobias, the fears that, that are destroying people's lives and we don't know how to get a handle on it. But we're trying, clearly better than we were 50 years ago. Thank you, Dr. Maroon. Uh, I think we have room for one last question, sort of a philosophical question here to, uh, to a segue from that. How can we get society to invest more in neuromodulation and other new therapies instead of only focusing on drug development for mental illness? That's a, that's a wonderful question. I, I think it, it comes by showing, like I this Dr. Segamucci at, at Harvard, what he's doing, uh, with specific, it's, it's the research. I think it has to be justified by ongoing research. And it's a catch 22. How do you do more re new research? You need more money. So, um, but just talks like this, letting people know what's available. I suspect that very few people listening to this presentation today knew anything about neuromodulation of the brain. I can tell you until a couple of years ago, I didn't. So um, it's, it's letting people know about this. It's in psychedelic psychiatry. What's the place? What is this going to be? But we know what we have now, particularly for depression and many of these disorders, fails in a very high percentage of patients and patients are less left, not they're, they're left not warehoused in a uh, or incarcerated in the mental institutions like before, but they're put on drugs that do the same thing in terms of their initiative, their thinking, their creativity, and their lives. So we have to do more. We have to do better. Dr. Maroon, thank you so much. Uh, again, just an incredible, incredible presentation. You're an amazing man, and we're so grateful to, to, to know you and you'll be in Pittsburgh with us. So Dr. Uh, Maroon, thank you. Dr. Freelander, would you like to uh, please close us out for the day? All right, well, thank you, Justin, and really wonderful presentation, uh, Joe. Uh, uh, really, really happy that uh, you're part of our department and, you know, very thought-provoking um, uh, presentation. Next week, we're going to take a, a small break, and the week after, we've invited Dr. Nathan Zweigerman, who's a recent graduate uh, from our program doing some fantastic uh, 
uh, work in uh, Milwaukee, and the title of his presentation will be When Building a Successful Practice, All Roads Lead to Pittsburgh. So until then, we'll see you. Stay safe and have a safe and uh, happy weekend. Bye-bye.